The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com. Empire. What if you could day trade sporting events? We ask the market during specific time blocks if there are more buyers in the market or if there are more sellers. If there are more buyers, the price will go up. If there are more sellers, the price will go down. And depending how many more buyers or sellers for that buying pressure versus sell pressure, that will go into our algorithm that will ultimately define the delta in price. That's Scott San Emeterio, founder of Ball Street Trading, where the markets just went real time. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. Scott San Emeterio's backgrounds in finance and his expertise is in trading. Sports obviously have exploded in the gaming, fantasy, and ultimately gambling markets. So the time was right to take his two loves, games and markets that change thanks to market changing criteria and turn it into a modern Dow Jones. Sports is back, it's good for everybody in the business, even if the fans can't attend and it's a strange upside down year. Let's welcome in our guest, Scott San Emeterio, who's the founder of Ball Street Trading, which is a really unique version of gaming that bridges not only sports betting, but the real-time markets. Hey, Scott, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Super excited to be here. Um, so you got into a tech space during a pandemic. Um, can you kind of just take me through the year before we kind of get into what Ball Street is? Yeah, I mean, in, in January and February, we were coming off the highs of the college playoff the Super Bowl, really getting excited about March Madness. This was going to be our big coming out party and really focus our energy on user acquisition and getting some real marketing done to get word out that we have this platform for any and all live events. And then the pandemic hits, you know, still remember that day where the NBA is canceled, Tom Hanks has COVID, and seemingly the world stops on a dime. And for us, it was just about understanding the moment and figuring out how we were going to position ourselves through it. Uh, for us, it was, you know, pretty obvious that this was probably going to be a pretty big deal when it, we talked about the sports landscape and where that calendar ultimately was going to get reset to. So for us, it really was focusing on as much as possible esports. Like everyone else, those first couple of weeks, everything seemed to shift to the digital aspect of how people were going to consume that fan experience. And for us, it was about really trying to understand the landscape in esports, doing our discovery, doing our diligence, and really trying to figure out where we can live inside that landscape and feel as if we found the right partners, we would be able to put ourselves in a position to introduce this to a tech-savvy audience and really give us an opportunity to explore a new vertical outside of conventional sports and ideally be in a position when sports came back to be able to have not only the NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball all ready to go, but then be able to lean into the esports world that we all know is still for a, a real mainstream push. All right, so, and we're here. Uh, week one of the NFL, as we're taping, just completed last night. Uh, college football is semi-back with the conferences that are going, and of course, the NBA and the NHL are charging towards playoffs, baseball as well. Did you achieve what you intended in the time during the pandemic? We did. You know, we were lucky enough to meet some really interesting and smart people to help teach us a lot of how esports, or at least from a business perspective, is set up and where we can ultimately look to position ourselves. Um, and now as we look to take some of those partnerships forward for the rest of 2020 and into 2021, we now get to really focus our attention back into uh, the more conventional sports as we have. Like you said, the NBA is, is going uh, full steam ahead. And we just had a week one, which I would say by all accounts was a, was a huge success for the NFL. And I think everyone's really excited to have um, our Sundays back. Okay. So let's talk about Ball Street a little bit here. Um just in general, I'll, ha I'll have you describe it. Um, what is it? Yeah, so Wall Street is a real-time prediction market that lets fans compete against each other in real time while they're watching. It's, in effect, a in-play contest that lets you compete against everyone else who's also watching the game. We created a 
prediction market that trades off of win probability. So our markets trade from zero to 100. The shares of the winning team will expire at 100 at the end of the game, and the shares of the losing team will expire at zero. You as a contestant will enter one of our tournaments, much like you would enter a poker tournament where everyone gets the same number of chips, but with us, you're going to get a portfolio of assets. So last night, you got 100 shares of the Steelers, 100 shares of the Giants, and $2,000 in virtual currency. And you now have the opportunity to out-trade everyone else in the market while you're watching the game. Our markets are completely real-time and completely peer-to-peer. The only thing affecting our pricing are the players in the market itself. So you're not competing against the house. You're not competing against the sports book. This is much more a poker game than a hand of blackjack or you're making a bet against the sports book. So am I buying stock in the Giants when they're down 7 nothing? That market then changes? Is, would you? Can you kind of describe it that way? Exactly. So what will happen is, depending on where we IPO the game, where we'll set the opening price, players in the market will ultimately define whether they think the Giants are more likely or less likely to win based on what they're witnessing on the field. So if the Giants and the Steelers opened up at 50-50 because we had the spread last night, and the Giants fall down 7 nothing. Giant shares probably begin to sell off to around 45, 44. Uh, you then have the opportunity to buy those cheaper Giant shares in hopes that they're going to get the ball and march down the field and score a touchdown, therefore hopefully driving perception in the market that the Giants are more likely to win uh, to where those prices potentially now move from 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, back up to 50. Um, and you know, this is basically the, the mapping of the flow of the actual game itself. And we think this is the ultimate engagement tool for fans yeah. to where they get the opportunity to be a part of that story as those teams are playing. Um, were you a day trader in your past? Yeah, so I spent 13 years at Credit Suisse in their fixed income trading department, uh, yeah. specifically in MBS. And I was yeah, I was on their subprime desk from 2007 to 2010. So I had a front row seat to all the, the chaos of the crisis. And this is sort of what came out of my brain when I figured out that a life of financial <laughs> services probably wasn't going to treat me very well after that. All right. So, so you took the background and obviously you're a huge sports fan and you finally figured out a way to marry the two loves, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm admittedly not a huge sports better. Um, every once in a while, I'm able to put a bet on a game if I'm around some friends. But I, you know, growing up, I just never felt that I had control when I put money into a, a, a sporting bet. So for me, it was really how do I take the control that I have in trading? Um, and also, I was a huge online poker back during the boom where I played probably every single day and take that aspect of poker where I felt I at least had some level of control, whether I was betting, folding, or raising in a hand, yeah. uh, and really create something that allows sports fans to be part of that event and ultimately to be a player themselves. And with the, with the markets, it really creates an opportunity for us to allow people to compete against each other and not necessarily compete against the odds that, you know, DraftKings, FanDuel, or MGM are putting out there. Um, all right. So um, let me, let's talk about the modern fan just for a moment as, as you are doing something that is going to keep them engaged moment to moment um, within the game, which I'm, I'm sure is extremely valuable, not only to you, but potentially to people who are marketing that want to keep the viewers and eyeballs on it. I'm a dinosaur. I'm old. I'm middle-aged. I will watch a game start to finish. I'm finding, and I think you know this, younger generations are skipping around. They're in a red zone world. Um how do you kind of manage the idea that the modern sports fan on a Sunday might not be watching from kickoff to the end of a game and they're skipping around and watching a million different things? I think part of what we've built is trying to create a partnership with that viewing experience. We want to enhance that experience. So whether the fan is watching from kickoff to the last whistle or they're watching on red zone, we want to create an experience that is going to divert some of that attention to the phone. We know everyone's going to be on their phone on some level. So if we're able to create a fully engaged experience where there is both entertainment, there's ego, there's competition, and ideally there's some sort of financial reward, we think that fans will likely be more able to drive attention to a full length of the game. You know, the way our markets also work is we understand that if you think about markets or even odds that, um, you know, someone scores a touchdown, the odds that DraftKings ultimately is going to push out there are going to probably move pretty heavily on who's ultimately going to win that game. For us and the way we've created the market is we've slowed that down to where we want the markets to trade off with momentum. So our prices are never going to jump from 30 to 70 in two prints because someone did it. Someone had to pick six the other way. Instead, our markets are going to slowly and methodically grind up from 35 to 70 because more and more people in the market are now starting to buy those shares. So that gives everyone an opportunity, whether you're staring at the Wall Street screen or you have it in your pocket or you're at the bar or you're sitting at home on the couch, 
gives you time to go pick up the phone, log in, see where the market is, make the trade, and still feel part of that experience. We know that people aren't going to be staring at their phone the entire time. So we've really developed a way that they can be part of that broader market experience without having to feel like they're obligated to literally pay day trader the entire way. You know, for us, it's about really creating this video game experience first. Yeah. We want this to be approachable, intuitive. We want almost to feel like um, this is the Fisher Price of Robinhood. You know, <laughs> people have, ex- have described the app like a Nintendo controller, AV, right? It's as simple as that. We want to remove all of the as a trader have to make other than which team do you think is going to win over the next five to 10 minutes and you're going to buy some shares because you hope they're going to march down the field, score a touchdown, then you get to sell them when they're in the, when they're in the touchdown because all that late money is coming in to, to pump them, but to pump that price up a little bit. But with the obviously with the currency um, that is given to me to play the game, I can go game to game, right? I'm going at the one o'clock kickoffs and I can see that Cleveland is down seven, nothing. So I can, and I think that they're going to end up winning and I can buy their stock at a better value at that point in time. And then I could jump over to the Jack Jacksonville game do the same thing is that right exactly what we've been really trying to focus on is trying to pick the very best games of the week um, but though that scenario certainly is there that you would be able to flip through or as you're watching red zone you're seeing someone getting into the red zone so you might want to pop some shares right there see if they actually get in and sell them if they if they if they, either both ways if they, if they made it in you can sell them for a little bit of a profit and if they don't make it in or they take a field goal or, or they turn the ball over you can sell those shares right away and wait for the next opportunity so for us it's really about creating this open flow uh, that will be ideally an enhancement so that your Sunday experience or really any fan experience while you're watching a live event, whether it's, like I said, uh, the NFL, NBA, or even esports. And, you know, even last year we did a, a market on Game of Thrones on who was going to ultimately win the Iron Throne. <laughs> Support for this podcast comes from AT&T. 5G from AT&T is fast, reliable, secure, and nationwide. So should you switch? Well, historically, those were the reasons new tech was adopted. Neanderthals saw that fire heated things fast and made their caves secure from rampaging woolly mammoths. The ancient Romans saw that the aqueducts were a reliable and fast way to transport water, so they stopped carrying water jugs on their backs and adopted them nationwide. Oh, and uh, 1800s Victorians saw electricity light up rooms fast and be more reliable than candles blowing out, so they stopped bumping into walls and made it nationwide. Today is no different. Switching to AT&T 5G is kind of a no-brainer. I mean, historically speaking, it's smarter than candles, water pots, and hungry dinosaurs. AT&T 5G. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan may not be in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. Talk to me about how uh, the markets change and how that works. Um, Listen, I don't have a financial background, so I stay away from the stock market in general, but my idea is supply and demand on stock sales is what kind of controls the pricing and how it goes. You can correct me if I'm wrong there. It's exactly right. What we've created really is a momentum trader to where it's really supply and demand. We basically ask the market during specific time blocks if there are more buyers in the market or if there are more sellers. If there are more buyers, price will go up. If there are more sellers, the price will go down. Now, depending how many more buyers or sellers are that buying pressure versus sell pressure, that will go into our algorithm and that will ultimately define the delta in price. So, you know, if you're one individual guy coming in to buy 10 shares of the Giants, you might only move the market by eight cents. But if you have 200 people coming in and buying the Giants because they just scored a late touchdown, that price could potentially begin to move in a more methodical way up where over, you know, a 60 second span, that price can move potentially 10 points. Okay. So I guess that was my question. The algorithm is, is going to be a supply and demand base. I was wondering how long it took for you to figure out how to get to a sweet spot of making these markets seem realistic and fair. The algorithm took me about six months to build. Yeah. So that, that was a, that was a labor of love trying to really figure out and, understand what is a good experience from both a trader as yeah. well as what we like to really call the Wall Street player, which is, I think, more of a video game player for us. You know, it's about understanding that an open book type of market, which is what you would have on the New York Stock Exchange, what you have on the NASDAQ, and even sometimes I see some of these ideas coming out now in the sports space. When you have an open book, meaning that someone is actually putting a bid or an offer in, that's an extra layer of complication that you as a player have to now deal with because I don't find it very fun really to put my bid in at $55 and one cent. And then you come in and put your bid at $55 and two cents. Now I have to go cancel my order and re put my order into the market. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of steps for me ultimately to put a trading. So for us, it was really about how do we simplify that experience to where it's literally two buttons. Are you a buyer or are you a seller? Um, the end game for you 
is this for is this expected in your mind to be Nasdaq? The this is going to be real money flowing back and forth between traders, and it's going to be on whatever that scale becomes. So our goal right now is to scale this as a free to play. We want to leverage the platform and invite brands to tell their story inter game during natural game breaks, right? So we actually look at ourselves as a marketing company, not a gaming company today. Our goal is, to, like I said, to scale the app to where we can begin to have conversations with partners. Now, whether those partners are gaming operators like DraftKings and FanDuel, or even potentially retail broker partners like TD Ameritrade or Robinhood, yeah. where we can ultimately think about bringing this onto a real money platform that would look very much like a poker tournament or a DFS contest where you would come in, you'd pay $10, and that $10 would go to the prize pool. And based on how you finished in that contest, you would ultimately be paid out. Uh, the longer term play for us really is to figure out how we can become the ultimate building blocks for where I think the evolution of gaming goes. I think we can probably all on some level agree that the future is going to be in real time. The future is probably going to be peer to peer. I think the, you know, the mm. American sports betting exchange is coming. I think there's a lot of hurdles with latency and the wire act that we have to work our way through. And we're probably a good five years away from that. Yeah. So for us, we want to build some of those early blocks that will hopefully be used for what that will look like later on down the line. You know, it's funny too. I mean, just, and this is kind of, you know, an aside, but I've, I've met a lot of people like yourself who have a financial background, kind of understand the markets, always were interested in spinning themselves into this field of sports gambling where they are looking for angles and edges because they seem to understand it. What, what you are actually introducing here is to someone like me who doesn't have that background, but is a sports gambler and a sports better. Um, access to understanding financial markets. Like we're, you see this wild west of all these different people coming in here that are trying to get customer acquisition for betting platforms as it legalizes around the country. You could be a gateway to TD Ameritrade and Robinhood and those type of, of outlets to teach them how to understand a financial market. Exactly. We want to be the bridge between sports fans, sports betting, and financial markets. The education that you can ultimately pull from our markets is very real. We have a deal with or a partnership with Ohio University where they are now bringing our markets and um, adding that to the curriculum to help people understand how markets work. There's huh. a lot of game theory. There's a lot of strategy. That's... Even just the technicals of where support and resistance lie on specific games for specific reasons, it's all there. And if you watch our markets, you can actually see them behave very much in similar patterns as real markets where if you're watching Tesla or Apple trade, they're doing the same exact thing. Um, so for us, it's really very much trying to play both sides in that we can fall to the gaming side of things pretty easily. But for us, I think it's almost as if not more interesting to go to the retail brokers and talk to TD Ameritrade and say, hey, we can be an educational tool. We can be that platform that your traders play with after they're done trading the market at four o'clock. Scott San Emeterio is the founder of Ball Street Trading. It's really cool. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it so much. All the best. Support for this podcast comes from Twilio. Right now, businesses all over the world are trying to reinvent how they connect with the world. Whether you're delivering packages, treating patients, or running a global customer support center, your customers need you to invent new ways to stay connected. Twilio is the platform that millions of developers trust to build seamless communications experiences with phone calls, text messages, video calls, and more. It's time to build. Visit Twilio.com to learn more. That's T-W-I-L-I-O dot com. On the next Future Sport podcast, staying fit in a pandemic, it's a worldwide issue. If we're not managing the load during the training week, so, so during the training week, we need to have a mechanical load that's preparing an athlete to perform uh, during a game. We, we don't want to overload the mechanical load, but we must We must also have a mechanical load during the week to match the performance um, that we expect of the player uh, during the game time. That's Paul Balsam, head of performance innovation with Leicester City of the English Premier League. We'll talk about navigating the pandemic and how athletes are adjusting to new normals. That will do it for this episode. As always, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com.